Pollard, welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's leading cardiologists. But it's been a lifetime of work that has been circumscribed by a deep, passionate interest in traditional approaches to healing from Ayurveda and India's heritage. And an enormous interest and commitment to issues of public health and the ethical dimensions of medicine. He's been a president of the National Science Academy till very recently. He was vice chancellor of the Manipal University, but made his national reputation really as a long serving professor and director of the Sri Chitra Medical Center in Trivandrum, where he was responsible for developing the indigenous heart valve, blood bags, and numerous products which were able to find commercial application in industry. He's most recently been awarded the Padma Vibhushan. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. M. S. Valiathan. Uh, Dr. Valiathan, you've been recently, uh, you know, completed this, well, not so recently, but uh, um, uh, in, in, in recent months have released this book on the uh, Charaka's uh, writings and his philosophy and approach to medicine. Uh, I, I found fascinating the aspect of um, destiny and medicine, in a sense, that uh, medicine seeks to heal people and uh, in what ways is that juxtaposed with traditional notions of destiny of fate uh, Rajiv thank you very much uh, as you said I have been a wanderer in more sense than one uh, geographically but uh, even in uh, intellectual terms for 30 years I was uh, intensely involved with uh, cardiac surgery development of uh, technology uh, then for five six years I was equally intensely concerned with higher education, setting up a private university. And now, now the evening shadows are falling, so I have turned to this traditional system of medicine in India, which uh, flourished at the time of the Buddha. If you read the dialogues of the Buddha, there are a number of references to Ayurvedic practices, even though the term was not used. But it continues to be flourishing today, like an evergreen tree, uh, because uh, I believe 70% of the Indians uh, use Ayurveda sometime or the other, somehow or the other. Uh, so many Ayurvedic colleges taking 11,000 students a year. So here is a system which uh, for 900 years it was neglected, 200 years it was suppressed, and now it has uh, rebounded uh, to this extraordinary position. So there is something in the system. But, you know, the system, as uh, you know, in your writings point out, has, you know, this, the, the, what you've written about really derives from the Atharveda and, 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 and onwards, you know. Um, it, it, it's both a sort of a philosophical system and a system of healing. Uh, and, and, and the philosophical system talks about destiny, it talks about larger larger issues such as that yes. and and even in our everyday lives uh, you know we in India are very much sort of driven by this notion uh, so what how does you know the, 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 the possibility of intervention of human intervention balance with this notion of destiny very interesting <laughs> question because Ayurveda as you know it is not merely a system of medicine it has a very strong philosophical basis and especially this question of destiny in India we always had two schools of thought one was everything is predetermined. The law of karma operates. There is nothing that you and I can do. Whatever is uh, bound to happen is going to happen. Uh, that was one extreme. But it is little known that there was an equally strong view that human will can overcome everything. There is nothing the human will cannot overcome. And that view was called Paurusheya view, which was pioneered by Yoga Vasishta. In fact, there is one particular verse from that which says, fortune favors the brave and the industrious. It is the weak-minded who talk about fate. Why not defy fate and put your whole strength into what you are doing? If at the end of it, success evades you, what harm is there? This is a verse from that. So we had that view also. But Charaka in Ayurveda, he took an intermediate position. He always did this. There is something, a Buddhist ring about it neither of these extremes. He would say, for acts of enormous sinfulness, this law of karma will operate. There is nothing you can do to change that. But the great majority of our actions do not fall in that category, especially when it comes to well-being. The great majority of our actions, they are all within our control, 
there is no necessarily a moral content in it. So the responsibility for well-being is with each of us. So someone you know, who has moved from you know, the sort of hardcore cardiac surgery right. and as, as dramatically interventionist as you can get right. uh, to the study of Charaka, uh, do you feel in, 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 in contemporary medicine uh, there is a, 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 a scientific basis, uh, you know, you read of research of the impact of prayer and of meditation and, and, and what have you. I think there is a role for both. Suppose somebody has a fractured leg, you have got to set that fracture. Praying will not heal that fracture. There is a definite role for that, for intervention, which was recognized in the ancient Indian medicine, Sushruta surgical techniques. He was repairing the nose and repairing the ear, operating for renal fistula. So it was recognized, you have to intervene, wherever there are mechanical problems. But there is always that immeasurable element. You are dealing with uh, the human being about whom everything is not known. So if you want to predict the outcome, you have to know everything. Now, at that stage, we have not reached. You may do exactly the same operation for the same condition, but the outcome may not be the same. Now, that unpredictability, that immeasurable element, certainly is there. You know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the traditional uh, perception of, of, of Indian philosophy uh, towards achieving good health has been one of you know, enormous austerity and, and discipline and, and uh, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, almost of, uh, of abdication of, of, of seeking pleasures and, 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 and fulfillment through the senses. And yet you have suggested that, uh, you know, uh, wine and, 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 and abundance and all kinds of foods and, and uh, meats were prescribed. Uh, how valid are s those assumptions today? I mean, or, or are this sort of emphasis on vegetarianism and frugality and food and, and behavior and what have you, uh, how, how, how do these two coexist and, and juxtapose themselves? In terms of sort of, you know, common sense understanding for, for an average person, you know, what do I do with my life? I mean, is it all right to drink? Is it all right to eat meat? Uh, this uh, view about uh, Indians, uh, very austere, world announcing, that is a profoundly mistaken view. Uh, in the Vedic times, uh, people uh, lived a good life. They wanted to live a hundred years. If you come to Ayurveda, uh, for example, he says, what are the urges for human endeavor? He is very clear. He says, the first is Pranayashana, you want to live a long life. Second is Vittayashana, you have to have some money. You have to have wealth because nothing is more miserable than a long life of poverty. These are his own words. And thirdly, he says, there is Paralokaishana, that is a blessed afterlife, that also may be there. So these are the three urges. So in the code of living that he prescribed, there is a place for uh, enjoyment. Uh, all kinds of food, as you said, meats, for example, use of wine, uh, festivals, parties. All these are described, uh, very enjoyable life, and live up to 100 years. So this was uh, very much a part of uh, the philosophy of living at that it time. It was, but you know, how applicable, and, and what are the sort of practical dimensions uh, in, 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 in living today? Uh, you know, what would you recommend? I mean, you've been a, a practicing physician, a, a, a doctor yourself. Uh, what is sort of an ideal, practical, possible worldview? I think uh, living in moderation, <laughs> uh, like uh, whether it is food, uh, whether it is physical activity, uh, sleep, in all this, I think that is, uh, of course, this moderation is a, is a vague term, uh, how much exercise you should do, how many calories you should consume. Of course, it translates into quantities, that's a different issue altogether. But that all these have a role in that. Uh, similarly, an attitude, uh, that is very important. Uh, your attitude uh, to life, to success. Uh, all these in the code of conduct which uh, Charaka prescribes. He comes out, for example, in one place he says about attitude. Do whatever you do with complete enthusiasm. But don't worry too much about the results. This is one of the things he says. So like that, uh, the uh, whole attitude to life and using your senses, including mind in moderation, uh, those are the prescriptions for uh, for well-being, for a happy life. You're watching a conversation with Dr. M. S. Valiathan, cardiologist, scholar, and author. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Smoother drive.
with extra premium. 91 octane petrol with additives. The best your vehicle can get. From Indian Oil. One of India's leading public sector commercial banks with a full range of products and services. Allahabad Bank now offers 100 million equity shares of 10 rupees each for cash through 100% book building process. Issue opens April 6, closes April 12. For details and risk factors, refer to the Red Herring Prospectus. Ah. <laughs> Sardhan, keval ISI mark vastuon ka hi prayog ki jiye. Shahar mein ek dard na khaat sa, aur ek building giri. Sekhru ghaal. Zang, natija building ki maat. Zang ka ilaj? Shri Ultra Cement, jis ka vishesh gun, building mein lage lohe ko zang se bacha hai. Shri Ultra, zang rodhak cement. Sab se tez janwar. सबसे तेज गाड़ी सबसे तेज इंटरनेट सर्विस एम टी एन एल ब्रॉडबैंड एक्स्ट्रा पिकअप विद एक्स्ट्रा प्रीमियम 91 octane petrol with additives. The best your vehicle can get. No, it's my turn now. Hey, hey, hey. From Indian Oil. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Dr. M.S. Valyathan. Uh, you have been looking at uh, the um, applications, the unfolding of Ayurveda in contemporary society also. Um, you know, Ayurveda was sort of this, this this intense holistic practice of healing which so totally consumed the uh, practitioner. Uh, you know, along with New Age spirituality, we're also really looking at New Age Ayurveda. Uh, are there risks in that and what are these risks? We often tend to assume that just because something is non-Western, non-allopathic medicine and because it's Ayurveda, it's safe. And, uh, you know, it can only do you good and it won't do you any harm. Right. Well, Ayurveda is a system of uh, medicine, apart from philosophic foundations and so on. And uh, Ayurvedic medicines also have risks, complications, just like modern medicine. But of course the degree of it would be less, because we are using basically herbal extracts. Now if you take uh, a herbal extract, when I was a medical student for example, we used to use digitalis leaf. Digitalis is a very important drug for heart patients. So whenever we were using digitalis leaf 50 years ago, we saw hardly any uh, toxicity of digitalis. But later on, we concentrated digoxin, real concentrated digoxin. Now the moment that came, it was very potent, we started seeing toxicity of digitalis. So when you use herbal preparations, you have a greater margin of safety. But it is not 100% uh, safe. Anybody can use it. You can self-medicate. That's a mistaken notion. Uh, and also there is like uh, modern medicine, there is a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, charlatanism, uh, which is perhaps more common in Ayurveda. So therefore, uh, uh, it requires proper training, proper apprenticeship. Uh, so uh, vulgarizing it in the name of tourism and so on, uh, it carries very great dangers. So it is necessary to, uh, to know what tradition is. So the new age Ayurveda, uh, there are many skeptics and I am also one of the skeptics. You, know, you have also mentioned and written about how sometimes you know things like um, wind, bile, and phlegm is really a gross simplification uh, of the of, of, of the human physical condition in a sense, and, and and we tend to sort of use these glibly in trying to look at solutions that we explain the basis of uh, Ayurveda. What is? I, I know this is sort of a large, huge question, but in in, in layman's terms. What is the basis of uh, Ayurveda's approach uh, to healing? You know, you've written about how, uh, you know, the same medicine in different parts of, 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 of a country, different regions, different times of the year, depending on the personality of the, the human being, will vary. What are some of the basic underlying assumptions, approaches uh, to Ayurvedic treatment? See, Trudosha, which uh, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, uh, that is one of the uh, foundation stones of Ayurveda. Uh, that uh, there are, it has many aspects, but one of them is something what you touched upon, what is called dosha prakriti. Each one of us has a prakriti, 
uh, what might call our constitution or disposition. Uh, one could be a vata personality. What could personality is a good word for that? One could be a vata type of personality. Another one could be a pitta prakriti. Third could be kapha prakriti. Now these prakritis characterize a person. His uh, physical, mental, all these characteristics are embraced by that term. What we might in modern medicine call phenotypes. These are recognizable. Ayurveda, of course, uh, elaborated on it on a very big scale. So these prakritis determine how a disease would manifest in that person. So tuberculosis. In a, these three different types or their subtypes, manifestation would be very different. One of them might have a lot of him bleeding, coughing up blood. Another man may not do it. One may have very high fever. Another may not have it. So that determines. Similarly, their response to treatment also is different. So therefore, you have to choose that particular personality and prescribe the medicine, tailor the treatment to that. Now, the present interest in modern medicine, modern science, there is actually a group in University of Pune doing this research. I am very glad to say that. Do these phenotypes, do they have a corresponding genotype? Their genetic makeup. Today we have the technology to do that measurement. Now, do they correspond to a particular genotype? Uh, there is a very big field called pharmacogenomics today, which uh, the attempt is to identify people and identify the response of their various drugs. That is a very big field in modern biotechnology. Now, the same method can be used here. So, if you have the old prakritis, they correspond to certain genotypes. That is an old concept being validated in terms of modern science. And there are many such possibilities. So, Ayurvedic research, not only the drugs from plants, which is a very important area, uh, there is a lot of money in it, but there are many other areas, scientifically equally important, which I, do, I don't believe we are doing enough in that. Even Western countries, they are looking to traditional systems which have survived for thousands of years, Chinese or, or Ayurveda. Maybe there is something in that. So therefore, we may not uh, be able to uh, convert all of Ayurveda, validate all of Ayurveda in terms of modern medicine. That is not an objective at all. The thing is, whatever we can take from it, made it into part of modern medicine like drugs, for example, that is fine. We should do that. But the rest of it, uh, don't uh, vulgarize it and call it New Age Ayurveda. Let it remain in that pristine glory. You're watching a conversation with Dr. M.S. Valiathan. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. रास्ते में बैंक पर उतर जाऊंगा मेरे बैंक में अकाउंट खोलो ओह डैड मुझे चाहिए एक मॉडर्न हाईटेक बैंक नेट बैंकिंग ढेर सारे रिटेल लोन्स इंटरेस्ट भी कम इजी रीपेमेंट क्या तुम्हारा बैंक लाइफ इंश्योरेंस देता है ऑफ कोर्स और सेविंग्स अकाउंट पर एक्सीडेंट इंश्योरेंस फ्री लो मेरा बैंक आ गया अरे ये तो मेरा बैंक है आप एक बेटा हो ट्रेडिशन ऑफ ट्रस्ट फॉर 140 इयर्स अलाहाबाद बैंक फॉर रिस्पेक्ट फॉर द रेड हैंग प्रोस्पेक्टस आ सावधान केवल आईएसआई मार्क वस्तुओं का ही प्रयोग कीजिए चलो इनसे पूछते हैं। ओके। भाई साहब, जी हाँ। ये विलास बात कहाँ पड़ेगा? मन्ने का बहाना चाहिए। देखिए सर अगर गाड़ी में एक्स्ट्रा प्रीमियम पेट्रोल डाला है, तो सीधे जाइए। अब फिर अगले गोल चक्कर को दो चक्कर लगाकर वापस आइए। फिर सीधे जाइए पांच किलोमीटर। आ गया राइट हैंड साइड रेड बिल्� more mileage with extra premium 91 octane petrol with additives. The best your vehicle can get. So, chale, extra premium hai, chale from ka. Indian oil. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Dr. M. S. Valyathan. Uh, we were talking about uh, how traditional complementary medicine is growing in popularity and how that might needs to coexist with, uh, with with modern medicine in a way. But isn't there the risk that traditional medicine will see far more quackery? Uh, than uh, modern Western medicine. Uh, you know, we already get sort of horrifying reports of, uh, uh, you know, quack doctors, of spurious drugs. Uh, isn't the risk much greater in, in traditional medicine? And, and, and what do you think can be done uh, so that, uh, you know, system of medicine that many of us, certainly in India, more naturally empathize with and, and relate to uh, can be substantively, constructively, and positively available and accessible to us? The danger is very real. Uh, because unlike uh, modern medicine, drugs for example, we have, uh, there is a drug act. Now that drug act is very strict, how a drug uh, can be tested, uh, or what precautions are to be taken, what permissions, approvals are taken, these are all very prescribed in great detail in the drug act. You have to go past all that before a drug can come into the market. But this is not the case 
uh, with traditional drugs. Traditional drugs do not go through the drug controller general. And uh, we have a pharmacopoeia which is very recent, uh, which is very incomplete. So we have virtually hundreds and thousands of preparations coming to the market, bypassing this kind of uh, regulatory mechanism. We have drug controllers in Ayurveda also, but that's uh, at the present time very weak. So the, I believe the, uh, there is a department of Ayush which deals with all this. Uh, they are very much uh, ceased of this now. And part of the reason for this interest is we are unable to export herbal drugs uh, to Western, Western countries. countries. So it becomes the commercial imperative that, that may uh, well pull this together. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, worked to our advantage in this, to the advantage of the Indian public, because there they insist on approvals, on testing and so on. Standards must be prescribed. So that is slowly coming. So once that comes, so that the public which takes an Ayurvedic preparation, whether it is in Delhi or Mysore or anywhere, uh, they have the assurance that just like modern drugs, it has the approval uh, standards, etc. Uh, it is coming, but it's too, too slow. Dr. Valithan, there is so much uh, to talk to you about, and I, and I feel I've managed the, you know, the time this evening uh, not very well. But uh, I, I, I did want very much to touch on your uh, you know, pioneering seminal work in cardiology. Uh, particularly uh, when you were working with the, the Sri Chitra Institute, uh, you know there are there are many good, great cardiac surgeons, uh, and then you were you were certainly uh, you know amongst the elite there. But your your great contribution was to look at developing indigenous technologies uh, that would make at low cost, uh, you know, available to the poor and and, and the common Indian, uh, you know, kinds of surgeries and interventions that would not otherwise have been possible. Uh, you know, you helped develop the, um, the the heart valve, the indigenous Sri Chitra heart valve, the you know blood bags, and a whole range of uh, products. Why hasn't that been an initiative that has substantially caught on? You know, you were able to transfer the heart valve technology. It's being you know manufactured. I know three thousand five five thousand valves are being made by a company in Madras. Why hasn't that become a movement? There's such a crying need. Is this sort of you know a, a globalized approach to medicine that is just keeping this down. We're now talking about, you know, the increasing price of uh, drugs because of patents. What is the hope? I know this is a large question, but I just, uh, because it's an area that has so, so, so interested you, I'm just sort of summing it all up for one. Uh, uh, is this, is that how is got th these things going to truly become accessible to people in India? It's a very tough problem because uh, we, our uh, adventure in uh, medical technology was basically need-based because we had limited amount of money. It's a government hospital. So if you have to buy heart valves in those days, imported valves, uh, the cost was such we could do only a very small number of patients. And there was no reason why we could not develop it ourselves. That's how we started on that. It was a long uh, endeavor, almost 10 years. Uh, but the problem with uh, which you touched upon, it is not confined to medical technology alone. Even if you develop, for example, defense production, all the R&D which we do, you have a first rate product which satisfies all the international criteria gone through all the tests. The first problem is to find a manufacturer. Manufacturers will ask always, what is the market? How many can I sell? Now, you cannot have millions of heart valves being sold. That's the first problem, to find a manufacturer, a good manufacturer. The second problem is, even if you manufacture it, the market, the users, because we are so brainwashed, anything foreign made in Western countries, uh, that will sell in India, and they have very sp strong marketing activity in India. So you have to compete against them. So the, w the Indian uh, doctors, for example, any day, they would prefer to use something made in the United States. Uh, they are least bothered about whether the Indian uh, technologic products satisfy the criteria. Nobody has the time to read all this. So they would much rather buy something made by a big Western company. So you have to fight against that. So when you develop a product, it is not only the sheer challenge of technology, but having overcome that, you have to find a manufacturer. Then you have to have this market. So it is by the time, like for example, Chitra Val, which has one third of the Indian market, which is a remarkable success, 10 years they have built it up. It requires more than anything else, apart from the excellence of technology, you require the most precious quality, that is tenacity. <laughs> you have to keep at it. 
then only you can succeed. You also pioneered in some ways uh, and, 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 and led this, this movement on, 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 on ethics in the medical profession. Sri Chitra, you were amongst the first institutions to constitute an ethics committee. Uh, you know, you're sort of out of active medicine now yourself, uh, but uh, there is this increasing loss of confidence and trust and faith uh, in the medical profession. Uh, you know, the assumption is that uh, you know, with the privatization of medicine, uh, you know, hospitals have to meet quotas of surgery, uh, and so whether you need it or not, you're going to get uh, surgery done on you, you're going to get unnecessary tests, and quite apart from the money and the finances involved, it's extremely traumatic for the patient. As in a sense, the senior statesman of uh, the medical profession, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of processes and possibilities do you see you know, for this being reversed, other than just sort of appealing to the good conscience of the doctor or the entrepreneur, which doesn't seem to be happening, what hope is there uh, that this can be substantially uh, arrested? Well, in spite of all the disorder around, I remain optimistic. Uh, but there is, as far as ethics is concerned, we have a, a National Bioethics Committee of the ICMR. I am actually chairing that committee. But that deals with the questions of clinical trials, of vaccines and things like that. But the problem of uh, ethics in practice, that's a different issue. Our National Ethics Committee doesn't deal with that. Medical Council of India is supposed to deal with it, but they have never dealt with it. The only way this question can be addressed, is there a way out? Yes, certainly. And that is we have to have quality standards. That is how many operations are being done. For example, take for example, cesarean sections. If you take uh, 20 hospitals, what is the cesarean section rate in these hospitals? How does it compare with the international rates? Now that's where we should start. I'm just giving an example. So you can take uh, a series of indices like this, complication rate, mortality rate, operation rate, investigation rate, are you doing unnecessary scanning, etc. So if you have a series of these and simply collect the statistics, don't mention the names of the hospitals or the names of the doctors. That's where the problem really comes. So don't mention that. So if you collect this, then you find that we are doing 100 patients coming. We are doing 80 scans. Whereas in a very advanced hospital like Mayo Clinic, they are doing 20 scans. You at once know there is some problem here. Our complication rate is 20%. In another country, say for example, Britain, or any other country where medicine is practiced very scientifically, their complication rate is 5%. So immediately you know and we have to do it ourselves. It cannot be done by the government. Profession has to do it. It can be done. We have professional associations. Unfortunately, they have not addressed this because of the sensitivities involved. But unless we do that and public become aware of this, that here is a profession which is policing itself, that way the public confidence can be restored. And the irresistible sort of final question to a, you know, a great master of medicine and, and good health in a sense, what is sort of, you know, a, a few simple sentences, guides, advice for a healthy old age? <laughs> you know, you, you've been a cardiologist to, you know, keep one's heart in one shape and spirits and, you know, the arthritis away and, 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 and you know, all the, all the diseases of modern medicine. Is there a, you know, a, a simple thumb rule? Oh, I think the simple thumb rule is what uh, Charaka said. That is, uh, all our senses, including the mind, whether it is our taste or smell, all the sen five senses and the mind. If you stick to neither overuse, nor underuse, nor misuse, that is the code of conduct. That is the prescription for healthy living. Dr. Valiathan, thank you very much. This has been a great honor and a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.